Hello, my name is Char Denord. I'm the Poet Laureate of Vermont, and welcome to Poet Speak. Uh, today, Dennis Nurksey is my guest. Dennis is the author of 11 collections of poetry, including The Rules of Paradise, The Fall, The Border Kingdom, and most recently, Love in the Last Days, a retelling of the Tristan and Assault story. His parents escaped Nazi Europe and during, uh, during World War II. His Estonian father worked for the League of Nations in Vienna. His mother was an artist. Uh, and they moved to New York um, in the 50s, I believe 40s. it was, in the, yeah. in the 40s. Um, uh, Dennis's family moved back to live in Europe for a number of years, returning to the United States around the time of the Vietnam War. Nurksey lives in New York and has been named Poet Laureate of Brooklyn. In free verse lyric poems, Nurksey explores subjects both intimate and political, children, families, love, and the effects of war. The poems in his collection, The Fall, explore distant stages of the narrator's life, childhood, early marriage, and middle age. In 2002, in interview, Dennis said, I'm interested, as Kafka was, in those mundane, in-between roles, nurses, messengers. In discussing the two and three line stanzas of the poems in the fall, he observed, as a poet, you enjoy a line break, which between stanzas is like a double check in chess. It comes at you from different sides and has a great deal of resonance. And the hope is to be able to put the narrative elements in those spaces between the, sp the stanzas. Dennis has received a Whiting Writers Award, the best Hoken Prize from Poetry Magazine, grants from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Tain Foundation Award, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. He has taught at Sarah Lawrence, where he still teaches and is a long-term faculty there, the Stone Coast MFA program in creative writing, and Rikers Island Correctional Facility. He has also worked for human rights organizations, writing on human rights issues under his full name, Dennis Nurksey, and was elected to the board of directors of Amnesty International USA. Uh, welcome, Dennis. It's wonderful to have you here. And I thought uh, it would be um, wonderful if we could start with maybe a poem that you'd like to read. Thanks, Chard. I really appreciate that introduction. I think I might start with a a human experience poem sure. from my childhood. Then we can get into poetry specifics later. I really think that one of the things that made me a poet was the death of my father when I was eight years old. He waved goodbye to me. He had taken me to school. Mm. And I was one of those eight-year-olds who were too cool to wave, wave back to their dads. So I didn't, you know, I thought I'll give him a hug this evening. Yeah. And I never saw him again. Oh. He died of a heart attack. Mm. He had never been sick for a day, but that instilled in me some of the things that are serious in poetry, which is, you know, a sense of how vulnerable human beings are, mm. a sense of contingency that Mm. You know, we know the beginning of the second we're living, but we don't <laughs> know yeah. the outer edges of that second. Absolutely. And it also gave me a sense, which is very important in poetry, of trying to have a dialogue with somebody who might not answer. I think that's mm. something that a lot of poets do, you know. Mm. Poets are writing love poems. Mm and trying to say to another person what they could not say in the moment, you mm, know. Yeah. It's sort of the real life feelings that you don't say in real life. Mm. But that's a long-winded way of approaching this poem. This is just a poem about my father's death. Return from Flint. After my father died, the other children were kind and took great delight in giving me secret gifts, a juju bay hermetically wrapped in cellophane, a goose feather with a bent tip, a box of Ohio blue tip matches. They allowed me to win at stoop soccer, whistle ball, all their impenetrable games, 
whose rules are like the law, decipherable only when broken. The girls invited me to walk with them under tall, sticky pines, pulsing with the trance of crickets. Cindy kissed me, a girl with no name, touched my earlobe experimentally. Teacher let me pass the pyramid test, though I answered at random, just a whirl of zeros. Even the blue dog followed me home. Our cat brought me a sparrow, still flying gravely in its mouth. I was confused. Were they bribing me? If they loved me, it was strange as swallowing a moth. My mother made my birthday meal, large meatballs mixed with small Swedish and Italian, though even I understood she moved like a puppet on strings of supernatural fatigue. That night, I had my favorite dream, my father lifting me in strong arms out of Monday into Friday, out of August into November, out of childhood into old age. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, powerful poem. Um, how long after your father's death did you write that? <laughs> Probably about 50 years. <laughs> but you know, when I was yeah. a little kid, I yeah. wanted to be a poet. And I thought, you know, wow, someday I'll have material. My parents will die. I'll write about that. That's mm. a little of, mm. be careful what you wish for. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But your recall is amazing oh, in thanks. it. Um, uh, what, what did you, uh, how many drafts did that go through? And uh, how, how did you feel? Of, after you abandoned it in your last draft? My poems go through a lot of drafts. I mm. mean, typically, you know, mm. I mean, I'll, my finger will get tired from yeah. pressing the page down button and, you yeah. know. Yeah. I think, you know, that when I was a kid and some of the kids that I teach feel, you know, mm. well, why do I have to write this more than once? Yeah. And when you get older, that feels like somebody's saying, like, mm. why can't I have one strike when I'm up against mm. an incredibly efficient pitcher? You know, right. why do I have to have three strikes? Yeah. Um, yeah. It has to be a lot of fun to revise because it's something that you're not allowed to do in the rest of life, which is kind mm. of access yourself independent of time. Yeah. You know, when you write right. drafts after drafts, you're right. getting how you felt on right. Tuesday, on Friday, yeah. you know, in March and in April. And when you finish, yeah. it may be really how you really feel. And you, you can't do that the rest of the time. You know, yeah. when I'm talking to you today, it's just going to be yeah. Dennis on September 5th. <laughs> <laughs> Which just enough for now. Um, your father was a very well-known economist who escaped uh, Estonia. I guess the Nazis in his, in his uh, occupation well, in Estonia. And I don't want to make it too dramatic. He worked for the League of Nations. He was working in Vienna. Obviously, mm -hmm. he had to leave. You, yeah. know. you know, I mean, he had to leave because of the Nazis. It wasn't yeah. as dramatic as other refugees. But he did take one of the last boats out of Portugal in 1940. Mm. Uh, which was the only way you could leave Europe because Portugal was corrupt. And he actually met my mother on that boat, you know. Oh, and she could, was French, right? Uh, yeah, she was, she was, had dual, dual French and British citizen, citizenship, but uh -huh. she had, was born and grew up in France. And was an artist. And, and it, was an artist, yeah. Right. And you settled in New, New York? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and grew up there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and went, went to school there and... Well, we moved around. But yeah. yeah. And after college, you went to Harvard and graduated at a pretty young age. Yeah. You did a number of various things, which I'd love to ask you about and how they have influenced you as a poet. Um, you've worked uh, um, as a construction worker, 
a grant writer, a human rights representative to the United Nations, a street musician, a kindergarten teacher, translator, bartender, and a harpsichord builder. Yeah, of course so. I don't want to forget that I worked in a shrimp factory pulling the heads off shrimp. Okay, let's <laughs> add that one. Uh, so how, how have these um, various professions uh, and even avocations in influenced your, I mean, you were, ri you were writing also, I assume, at the same time that you were doing all of these things. Definitely, and um. yeah, I mean, some of it, honestly, what my thoughts were then, I don't quite get now, because when I was a little kid in the 60s, I remember thinking, you know, unlo unloading trucks on the waterfront for $6 an hour, <laughs> I can't do that because that's too bourgeois. I can, you know, yeah. I need to work at a real job where you get paid three dollars an hour. Um, what I was thinking, I'm not sure, but there is something coherent. Is that you know, I, I kind of do feel that, a, you know, our poets historically in this country have always been very connected to. Nobody knows what real life is, but. Mm -hmm. They've always been very connected to the life of other people and, mm -hmm. you know, how other people eat and put shelter over their heads and, yeah. you know, poets like Allen Ginsberg, you know, they had their own ideology, but they, they worked on freighters, you know, right, <laughs> they had right, right. blue collar jobs and it, it, it makes me a little crazy when people study poetry in high school, then in college, and then become poets, you know, yeah, and as you did. <laughs> writing about the process of poetry without, yeah, you know, having the experience of, yeah, I was writing poetry, but I, you know, I did want to have a wide range of experiences. I didn't want to, you know, after I graduated college, I didn't want to go to graduate school. I mm. Actually, uh, I entered a contest and wrote a paper that was complete BS, and I almost did it as a joke. You know, I mm -hmm. I took terms from the New York Review of Books, and I, you know, larded a paper on an obscure French text with these terms. <laughs> and then I found out I had won the contest, and I could go and study uh -oh. in France for free, and I thought, you know, if I do this, I'm really going to lose yeah. my integrity, and I didn't. You didn't do it. I didn't do it. I worked uh, in a factory. Aye, aye, aye. Huh. Um, you, you know, in, uh, as I just read um, in your introduction, you, you, you uh, said somewhere, I'm interested, as Kafka was, in those mundane, in-between roles, nurses, messengers. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? And um, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, when you, and, and what you uh, mean by Kaf as Kafka was. Uh, <laughs> well, that interview makes me nervous because I sound crazy pretentious comparing myself <laughs> to Kafka. No, no. And actually, in the context, I mean, it's more like I'm just saying Kafka was interested in Yeah, this. yeah, you know absolutely. I, mean? I don't think anyone yeah. thinks you were you're comparing yourself to Kafka. Right. I mean, I would not do that yeah. in a thousand years. But, um, you know, in the book Love in the Last Days, which yeah. is my most recent book, which we may discuss, it's a, uh, it's a retelling of the Tristan and his old myth. But mm -hmm. I have a certain interest in the servant who brings the love filter to the lovers. Uh, you know, there's a leper in the original m myth who is right. just seen as an outcast. And in my version, I want the leper to say, this is what it's like being in a leper, in a, mm -hmm. being a leper in a judgmental society. And, you know, the book is framed by a singer who sings the story and, mm. you know, it ends with what happens to the singer rather than what happens to the hero, you know. So these are... The jungular? Yeah, these are concerns that I have. Yes. For, you know, the people who might be bit players in traditional poetry. You were, ref you were referring to, is her name Branjan? Bran the servant, yeah, Branjan. Branjan. Um, 
who is is Salt's servant yeah. and mistakenly brings the filter or the yeah. love potion, yeah. the love um, drink to both of them, who, uh, who yeah. then drink it and, and fall in love, um, and then um, enter into this adventure, yeah. uh, essentially, right? Right. Which you have put a very fascinating psychological uh, spin on in, in many ways. Um, you're Thank telling, you. you're retelling the story, but you are retelling it with um, a, re a remarkable insight into both of their psyches. Um, oh, thank you. And yeah. maybe you could, yeah, could talk a little bit uh, about what the your retelling or what your main interest in the re in this in the retelling of the story is. Yeah. Well. And why it's relevant today? Because it yeah. took place in the 12th century. It did take place in the 12th century, <laughs> and I think it's crazy relevant. And I think it's crazy relevant first of all because the nature of stories and narrative in human society. This story took place in the 12th century and it's about a woman who is destined to marry a king. She marries the king but she falls in love with one of the king's knights and they escape into the deep forest. Mm. That alone is about a couple things. It's a extremely subversive story. You know, this yeah. couple is yeah. breaking the laws of the church. They're committing adultery. They should go to hell. They're also breaking the feudal contract. Mm. The hero is renouncing his sworn oath to his liege. And then to me, there's something fascinating about okay, they're leaving the rules of civilization and they're going to the deep woods. How do they survive in the deep woods? So it's an extremely subversive story. You know, it's a story in which the woman actually has a lot of power. Yes. But it's also a story with a lot of disquieting elements. The Isolde, the heroine, will order her servant to sleep with the king so the king Brangin again. Yes, so the king mm. will think that she's a virgin, but mm. you know, that's sort of almost like being an accessory to sexual violence. I mean, the servant mm. didn't agree to do that. She's just being commanded to do that. So they're disquieting elements in the story. But again, it's a very subversive story and it's fascinating to me that in a really strictly censored society, that story flourishes. You know, there are thousands of ver versions of it that spread throughout Europe mm -hmm. over hundreds of years. You know, people just yeah. grab a guitar or a lute and sing the story right. around the fire. So the story of defiance of authority just keeps spreading mm. at a time of maximum authority. and. You know, it's a story about defying social control. It's also a story about, in my version, I think there's a little PTSD in it, you yeah. know, is that yeah. Tristan is trying hard to be a hero. And when he gets to the wilderness with his lover, he doesn't know quite how to, what to do. And I have found in the book that I think that this is something that women understand better than men because uh, he still wants to fight imaginary enemies. And monsters. And monsters in the middle of the forest. And he's more interested in doing that than in catching rabbits or making sure that the couple has a roof over their head. Mm. The closer he gets to her, the more anxious he is and the more he has to be the perfect hero yeah. and the great lover. And that dynamic ends up separating them because she needs somebody who lives in the real world. And, and, can, fee and yeah. can feed her and hunt. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You used a fascinating phrase to describe the, uh, the undercurrents in the book. I, um, with me recently, you talked about it's fetishized, um, it's fetishized uh, hierarchical violence. Yeah. 
Um, and uh, could, could you just explain that term a little bit uh, more? Oh, yeah. I detail. mean, I think to me that's the connection between the Middle Ages and our age. You know, I mean, people are really violent, but they almost don't know they're violent. They just feel it's natural, you know. Yeah. Um, in the in the story, you know, the, the hero feels it's natural when he's a knight, he feels it's natural to terrorize the peasantry searching for the Holy Grail yeah. at the yeah. command of the king. The, right. uh, the heroine feels it's totally natural to betray her servant and put her in a life-threatening situation. Mm. They're not really thinking twice about doing things that they're entitled to do, but yeah. that might look really strange if you yeah. didn't have a society organized around principles of inequality. Yeah, there's a kind of wild extravagance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would, you, would you say, in both of the, in, in their fatuous love and, yeah. and, in, and in their sort of on the, in their lamb experience on the yeah. lamb and, yeah. uh, and of course in the hunting uh, yeah. scenes. Maybe you could read a, a piece and sure. people could get an idea for the incredible language. I think you've been working on this, what, for 30 years? Well, certainly over 20. <laughs> uh -huh. You've been obsessed yeah. with the story and uh, yeah. have, um, have had this wonderful ambition of retelling one of the most famous legends in in uh, English, um, although it was Middle English um, when it was written. Yeah, this version was actually, the version that I based this book on is a translation of the French troubadour oh, the fr version. Okay. Uh -huh. And I, it's still available in English. I don't know if it's in print, but it's right. a vintage paperback translated by a guy called Hilaire Belloc, who was a, right. a British poet. Strange guy, and, but the original version is actually lost, isn't it? Yeah, you know, honestly, Chard, I'm not sure anybody knows what the original. <laughs> if it was just oral is. to begin yeah. with, yeah, yeah, because yeah. it, it exists in a lot of yeah. different cultures, and right, you know, you can't do a carbon test on something that was a spoken that's right. story. That's right. That's right. And of course, there's so many operas, right? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Of it, but we would love to hear here uh, one of the poems that you've written as you know, part of the narrative. I'm going to, with your permission, one of the things that this book tries to do, which relates to what we've been talking about, is give points of view of characters other than mm -hmm. The romantic lovers. So we have the point of view of the leper. He has his own poem and the servant. Mm -hmm. But we also have the point of view of imaginary speakers, the fountain from which they right. drink. The living well. Yeah, and the, the horse that they ride. I'm going to read a poem that's from the point of view of the dog. Oh, great. And right. this is... Great. You know, the dog who has sort of risks his life to rejoin the lovers. Do we have time for a little anecdote about the, uh, uh, yeah. the original story? Yeah. Uh -huh. In the original story, the dog crashes through the bushes and rejoins the lovers who have escaped to the wilderness. And he did what dogs do. You know, he spent months tracking them because he was desperate mm -hmm. to meet his masters and then the story says the dog greeted everyone in the party one by one, including the horse whom he despised. <laughs> and <laughs> that's kind of cool because like dogs yeah. do do that. If they yeah. they yeah. don't just greet the master, yeah. they acknowledge. Oh, I love the animals, a, the horse and the, uh, and the monsters, and every all the animals in this are kind of great. And in the, in the original story, not in my version, but in the original version, Tristan has magic powers. And if he shoots an arrow, he can command the arrow what it mm. could kill. My version is anti-heroic, so it doesn't have any of that. My version is psychological. Yeah, but in yeah. the original version, Tristan tries to train the dog not to bark because he's afraid of being discovered by the king's soldiers. 
mm. <laughs> that takes them years, you know. Mm. And it's so beautiful that mm. training a dog, even if you have magic powers, <laughs> it can be almost impossible. Right. right. I have a little puppy that speaks to me. So let Zephyr, me, right? Ah, uh, Zephyr, yeah. yeah. Let me give you this poem. Okay. The horse, beau joueur, who should be called gros joueur, keeps me awake all night rubbing his rump against smooth beach. He snorts deliberately loud. He has nothing to do except chomp delicious melic, talk about a forest of love. I followed my masters here because they are helpless, like God or a poor man in the wind and rain. I tore my coat. Who notices? Who pets me? They sniff each other like poodles, but with more drama. If they scold, it is each other. If they wander off, it is from each other. If they train anyone to fetch, sit, roll over, it is the other, the undying love. What hell it must be to hunt on such a tangled leash. Me they praise absently. Good dog. The other has a thousand faults which they tally in secret until a tirade overflows. You always, you never. Inwardly they denounce each other, but to whom? The trees can't understand them. Neither can the music too high pitched for their hearing. The birds don't care. Because they are lovers, every second they share is eternity. Fate drives them forwards. They have no clue how to scamper, how to prance. Sex baffles them, victory or defeat. Why always more so? Love makes their bodies a thorny thicket. She flinches at his wound. He cries for her loneliness. Perhaps through the scrim of desire they may glimpse the actual forest. Alder leaves like wringing hands. A nuthatch marching straight up a tall cedar. These woods are full of deer boar, elk, and bear, but the lover's longing is a magic cloak that makes all other creatures invisible. I have to guard them from wind, rain, and their minds. They fascinate me like the small dead things in the sedge. Tristan losing footing, manacled by his arguments, Isolt, who misses, salt, bells, and his absence. All night they moan, or choose to. The horse farts, and I have no other, except a touch of gray along my muzzle I can glimpse by squinting. Maybe I, too, am dying of love. Oh, that's, that's great. The dog maybe drank the love potion as well. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's an eloquent but, dog. <laughs> but the dog, is, the dog is kind of feeling, you know. Yeah, everyone who dies dies of love. I'm a dog. I've followed my master. Exactly. And I'm growing old and yeah. lame. I have the right to say I'm dying of love. Oh, that's too. that's beautiful. Speaking of dogs, you've written an, you've written another wonderful poem about a dog called The Searchers. Oh yeah. Um, do you have that book? Is it in the fall, I think? Uh, you know, I think I have that book. I, um, but maybe it takes a second to find it. Um, it let's see. Yeah, that's okay. We can talk while you're, you're looking for it. Um, you were in New York during 9-11. I was, yeah. And um, you apparently went down to Ground Zero. Well, again, it's a little bit like my dad being a refugee. <laughs> You know, it, mm -hmm. you could easily start exaggerating these things a yes. little bit, but, yeah. uh, you know, I was in Lower Manhattan, you know, I was one of the people who tried to give blood, 
mm -hmm. you know, all those issues. And uh, so it, it was a big deal to me. And in fact, I, I still write about that experience. And yeah, it was, you know, it took me a while to write those poems, well, but. So, so this poem about a dog in, in the rubble yeah. is, I think, a nice one to follow with the one. Thank you. The one you just read. Now, this is not in the voice of the dog, and it's a more serious poem. Searchers. We gave our dogs a button to sniff or a tissue, and they bounded off, confident in their training, in the power of their senses to recreate the body, but after 18 hours in rubble, where even steel was pulverized, they curled on themselves and stared up at us, and in their soft, huge eyes we saw mirrored the longing for death. Then we had to beg a stranger to be a victim and crouch behind a girder and let the dogs discover him and tug him proudly with suppressed yaps back to command in the rows of empty triage tables. But who will hide from us? Who will keep digging for us here in the cloud of ashes? Mm. Thank you. That's, that's a wonderful poem. Have you? That's an actual, you know, yeah. circumstance that the dogs were getting crazy discouraged so that they had to pretend mm -hmm. to allow the dog to find somebody mm. and bring him back oh, because I didn't they know. never found anybody and if they yeah. actually did that right. you know a, right. a volunteer would come and hide behind a girder and they'd say come dog sniff over here and the dog who was just mm. getting really demoralized because it couldn't do its job it couldn't save anyone in that devastation they mm. would find the volunteer and say, mm. look, I found the volunteer. Oh, really? And the dog would be, uh. you know, remoralized re and mm. able to do their job. Mm. And, you know, there's, mm. you know, a whole lot of issues in there of, mm. you know, mm. sometimes I think the poet Alan Dugan said, sometimes you have to lie to survive. You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a good example. Yeah. Um, in the remaining few minutes we have, what are, you, what are you working on now? Are you are you working on a new book? I'm working on a bunch of new books. You know, I'm, I have a new book of prose poems that, you know, is mm. more mm. topical. You know, they're poems about the Trump era. I have a, mm. a book that's kind of autobiographical. I have a book on nuclear power in the nuclear age because like it just freaks me out that mm -hmm. I grew up expecting to be blown up at any minute nothing changes in our circumstance <laughs> except that now we're worried about other things you know what I mean yeah. we're worried about the debt crisis you know yeah. the problems that defined me as a kid were never solved they were just forgotten you know yeah so I mean I I have a project where I want to write about people. And it's not totally simple, Chard, because there is a way of being concerned about nuclear weapons that can also be kind of mm. arrogant. You can feel like mm. my neighbors are worried about deer eating their broccoli and I'm worried about the end of the world. You know, so mm. just the way my Tristan and his old book is a little critical, that book is a, maybe a little critical of the anti-Duke heroes as well as being very supportive of them. Yeah. But honestly, it's going to probably take me 20 years to write that yeah. book too. But the good thing about being a poet is that while you're procrastinating writing on your master project, you're writing another poem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. just goes in a book of poems. Yeah. Um, you, you, I should mention, I, I didn't mention this, but you, you moved to Vermont um, during the summer months primarily, but yeah. have been up here also longer, for long, yeah, much longer yeah. periods. Um, 
decades ago. Sure. And lived in Athens or yeah, Athens yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, initially for many years, yeah. uh, not far from where I live in Westminster West. And then you recently, or in the last several years, moved to Arlington and are living yeah. there. Well, that now, was actually about probably 11 years 11 ago. 11 years ago. Or, and yeah. so maybe we, we could conclude on what, what is it about Vermont that you love and why, why uh, have you moved here uh, f after being the Poet Laureate of Brooklyn? And, uh, li and of course, you still live in Brooklyn yeah. as well. But Well, I mean, this is maybe a cliche, but the independence of spirit, you know, I mean, you really have people who are not corporate, they're not in the city machine, mm -hmm. but they're also not predictable, you know? <laughs> they're, they're living in the country, but they have a vast amount of their own experience and a vast amount of their own points of view and, and judgment. I remember being in Plainfield, Vermont, and of course that's where God art was, but yeah, you know, yeah. there was an auction, and the auctioneer is selling uh, to a bunch of guys in overalls. He's selling the original works of Edgar Allan Poe, and he says, well, you may think Poe was over the top, but he's a major influence on Baudelaire. <laughs> and people say, oh yeah, I bid $10. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. That's Vermont, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. different than Brooklyn. Uh, yeah, yeah. For I mean, you. yeah. What I do love way. about Brooklyn is the cultural diversity, and you don't quite have that here, but you do have, you know, you might call it a spiritual diversity. There are lots of points of view. It's not, mm -hmm. nobody is, you know, a predictable small town or country dweller, or if they are, I haven't met them yet. Right, right. Well, w would, would you like to read a, a poem in closing here? One that... Um, well, if I can find it... Any, any poem that you would love to yeah. read here at If I can end? find it quickly, I'll... Sure. Well, I'll read You're on sabbatical this year, right, from yeah. Sir Lawrence, so you get a chance to, to be up here all, all year. Yes, absolutely. Oh, I got it. Okay. Poets love to like shuffle through papers and it's because <laughs> we envy the wind and the leaves and the trees and we want to be like that. Oh, this is a poem about Living in Vermont, and it was originally called Newfane. Okay. But I changed the name to Protect People, but it was originally published under Newfane. And it's a poem in five parts about raising in a family. Newfane. How we love to create a world. Out of gray, we made the pin oak leaves with their saw teeth an odd waxy sheen dry and matte to the touch. Out of granite, we made the marriage house. And always, we added a flaw, which we called fire, or time, or the stranger. Two, a drop of water on the lip of a jug, trembling, trying to hold on for another second to the idea of sphericity. That was us, our nakedness. Three, we worked to thwart our happiness because it was so unexpected. Suffering tasted like our mouths. Four, we had a flagstone path, a pond, four birches, a dog racing in tight circles helpless against the dream of fresh snow. Tomorrow, that red Schwinn with training wheels must find a way to pedal itself. Five, world, 
like a child who learned to walk beyond our outstretched hands. Oh man, thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank that you. was really wonderful. I haven't heard that. And thanks for being here today. It's been wonderful talking thank you so to you. Much. Thank you. I appreciate it.